shall we open with a word of prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for the many blessings that you are always providing. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word and that of your prophet. Father, forgive us of our sins. Help us as we approach you, that we may learn of you and be prepared by you for the events that are soon to befall this world. May your angels be with us today. I thank you for each one that is here. I thank you for those that will view this later. Direct us now, guide us so that your word may become that for which we partake. For this we thank you, for this we praise you, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm going to open with a couple of additional documents. These will be sent to you after the meeting, and then we're going to get back into the main part of the study. But these documents dovetail very well with the study. Now, this first is a letter that was written in 1903, November 23rd, 1903, 100, roughly 118 years ago. Dear Sister Hall, we are safe if we do the will of our Heavenly Father. If I have any will of my own, I do not know it. Mark the closeness of the relationship between Christ and his Father. See the entire dependence of the Son on the Father, as shown in the words, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. Mark the implicit obedience in the words, For whatsoever things the Father doeth, these things doeth the Son in like manner. John 5.19 No less entire is to be our dependence on Christ, and no less implicit our obedience. Christ's words regarding this matter are definite. He was standing at the head of humanity and he set human beings an example of perfect obedience. Now, my admonition today will be to read these two documents. There is a lot that is contained here. There's going to be some very specific points that I'm going to go over that I've highlighted. Then we're going to go back into the study. The Son of God, enshrouded in the pillar of cloud, was the leader of the children of Israel, overseeing every phase of their existence. He educated and disciplined them, often testing their faith. Fleeing from Pharaoh's host, they found themselves at one time hemmed in by inaccessible mountains with the Red Sea before them and the enemy following hard after. The command came, go forward, and as they obeyed, the waters parted before them. Are we in any different straits today? Moses, the visible leader of the Israelites, was admitted into the secret councils of the Most High. The people were given evidence that Moses did indeed talk with God, receiving from him the instruction given them. Christ would have led the people into the promised land by a much more direct route had they shown a willingness to be guided by him and to place their dependence upon him. Are we any different today than the children of Israel? Had they obeyed the directions given by Moses, not one of those who started on the journey from Egypt would in the wilderness have fallen prey to disease or death. That is a very pregnant statement. But they allowed unbelief to enter their hearts and murmured against Moses and Aaron for bringing them out of Egypt, and punishment came upon them. The murmuring that has gone on within this movement after July 18th 
needs to be set aside. It has no place within this movement. The instructions given to Moses for ancient Israel with their sharp, rigid outlines are to be studied and obeyed by the people of God today. God desires his people to study these lessons and not follow their own judgment, making their own plans. God has shown that there is only one Lord and that he rules in the heavens and has given laws that all are to obey. Let us study the experience of the children of Israel and the Lord's dealing with them, his encouragement of the obedient and the punishment that came upon those who were determined to carry out their own devisings, supposing that finite human beings could become an authoritative power to which all must concede. God's divine philosophy is revealed in the experience of Israel, chosen by him from all nations to be his peculiar people. From his dealing with them, we learn that he must be obeyed and that those who are determined to exalt themselves must be blotted out. Now the next paragraph begins in the third month when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Here again, we start in Exodus 19. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now, what chapter are we looking at here? Exodus 19. And what chapter is the testimony, what we also call the Ten Commandments, given? Chapter 20. So the covenant is entered into before the Ten Commandments. Before they hear them. Correct. And that's a huge point, isn't it? Yeah. This is the great charter by which Israel was received as the Lord's chosen people. Now, if this is his divine philosophy, chosen from him above all nations to be his peculiar people, and the covenant is the great charter by which Israel is received as the Lord's chosen people, are we any different today than the children of Israel were at that point? No. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. Now, now the question is specifically, is this goes back to our study uh, that we had done in the past. So you're at Mount Sinai and to decide exactly what it is that Moses receives that we would call, I guess, the book of the law. We know it can't be the things that are received after right? In Exodus. Correct. Now in Exodus, when you go through Exodus, it doesn't have what we see in Leviticus 25 and 26. Okay. Right. But now here, here's a point of chronology. Yeah. When is Exodus 19 taking place? Well, it's just before they received the Ten Commandments in the third month. In the third month of what year? Well, the first year when they come out of the land of Israel. But what year would we describe that at if we were putting a number to that year? Well, it's 1533 BC. Okay. And, now, it, and it's also 2513 AM. Okay. So my, my question is this. <clears throat> 
when was Leviticus written? Well, it says, the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation. Um, so I don't know. Okay. Leviticus was uh, the following year, the first month. It's the of, following uh, year? Yeah, so it would be 15. 32 BC. So what's the basis for that? It gives you the date in the Leviticus. Where in Leviticus? That's what I want to find. Just put in first, first month. First month. Okay. Well, I don't have the first month mentioned in Leviticus, other than in Leviticus 23, and, uh, where it's talking about the feasts. The premise that I'm trying to get at yeah. I, I believe that Leviticus 26 and Exodus 19 are written in the same year, in the same 12 month period. Yeah. Would that be yeah. possible? Well, it's definitely possible, but what I'm trying to figure out is in Leviticus, does it tell us? So Stephen says it tells us when it's written in the book of Leviticus. But Leviticus is giving us all the information about the offerings. It would have to be mm -hmm. given earlier. Well, maybe I'm thinking of. I think you're thinking of. Exodus uh, 40, verse 17. And then, so you have Exodus 40, verse 17. So that's the first day of the first month. Yeah. Okay. So the next day, I think then would be Numbers 10. There's something I can't remember. Yeah, so Numbers is going to have a date as well. So that's the second month. Yeah, that's the second month. The but 20th Leviticus, day. Leviticus doesn't tell us yeah. as far as I remembered. But it would be logical then, you know, because before that there time you had Nadab and Abihu killed. Mm -hmm. So basically from the first day, of the, so like a 50-day period there, from when the tabernacle was dedicated until okay. they left Mount Sinai. So Leviticus was, is that history in that their first month? Yeah. Now it could be, though, that Leviticus, because Leviticus means, um, what did the word Leviticus mean again? Concerning the Levites? Yeah, concerning the Levites, right? So um, it could be that Leviticus itself, that much of it was given at that time, but that the latter part, because you do have these sec these different sections, um, the best blessings for obedience, for instance, in Leviticus 26, and also Leviticus, Leviticus 25, dealing with the sabbatical rest of the land in the Jubilee. I mean... I don't, I mean, it's possible. You could be po possibly be right. But the question that, that Dwight's bringing up is what is it that was the book of the covenant? Because before the 10 commandments were given, that book is going to be read. So something is read. And the question, what is that? And that's, that's a point that we're going to get into here as we go further in the in the study itself mm -hmm. yeah because so, we can sometimes make assumptions we could just say oh leviticus was written then but uh, you know it's hard to say obviously they're going to build the tabernacle and it, and it does make sense that once they build the tabernacle they're going to be given the order of service for the tabernacle 
But all of Leviticus isn't just about the tabernacle itself. Well, the the main point I think that I'm driving at is I believe we have agreed that God does not withhold from us things that are to our benefit. Yeah. And we also have in um, Leviticus 25, it says the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai. Right. Right. So that would be after they left Mount Sinai. Well, we're going to cover a lot of this. Or before they left Mount Sinai, I mean, not right. after. Yeah, okay. Okay. So yeah. when Mrs. White is giving, giving this reference, she is telling us that this charter, this covenant, by which Israel was received as the Lord's chosen people is something for us to pay attention with. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to switch this to the next document. Can you see this all right? Yeah. Okay. Please look at not only the date, but who is this written to? The brethren and sisters at where? Nashville. Well, yeah. Sorry, can I just, uh, just go back? It's um, Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. Sure. It's about the first day of the first month. Yeah. So basically from the Exodus you had the first day of the first month at the end of Exodus, and mm -hmm. then you have Numbers, first day of the first month there. So that, that was my my thinking that, that Leviticus was just applying to the first month of the second year. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is the first day of the second month in Numbers 1-1. One, one. Yeah, so... Second year, yeah. Levit Leviticus would just apply them to the first month. Except that, um, yeah, but so I'm just saying that parts of Leviticus are different. You can't just say that all of Leviticus was written at the same time, is what I'm trying to say. Because it says Leviticus 25 was when God spoke to Moses in Mount Sinai. So it's different from the beginning. But Dwight's going to go through that, right, Dwight? Yep. Okay, okay yeah, I see your point. So that yeah. was then, um, yeah, so that was the previous year? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So basically what, what I'm hearing, Stephen, is that it's very likely that this is that Leviticus was written within a period from the time that the children of Israel left Egypt until they came to this point that's outlined in numbers, right? It's within, within about a year's period. Yes. Okay. Now, this, this letter that's written to the brethren and sisters at Nashville, January 7th of 1904. This letter was published in the Southern Watchman, March 1st of 1904. The entire series that Mrs. White published in the Southern Watchman is excellent. If you have not read it, as I suggested, please do so. We're gonna to go to paragraph, I believe it's 44. The covenant that God made with his people at Sinai is to be our refuge and defense. The Lord said to Moses, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, ye have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces these words. And all of the people answered together and said, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. This covenant is of just as much force today 
as when it was when the Lord made it with ancient Israel. So as I read these words, this covenant that is not outlined in Exodus, but I believe it is outlined in Leviticus 25 and 26, is of just as much force today. Those that choose to decry and look to set aside the understanding of Leviticus 26 are entering onto very dangerous ground. Now, as we return to this in Malachi, where we left off last week, it is true men will say you are too excited. You are making too much of this matter, and you do not think enough of the law. They say, now you must think more of the law. Don't be all time reaching for this righteousness of Christ, but build up the law. Let the law take care of itself. We have been at work on the law until we got as dry as the hills of Gilboa without dew or rain. Let us trust in the merits of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Written, Manuscript 10, 1890. Yesterday morning I rose with an agony upon my soul, and I could only say, Lord, thou knowest all about it. I've been in that situation. I've been in that condition. My heart is burdened, and thou knowest that I cannot bear this load. I must have more help than I have yet had. Thou knowest that when I see men taking positions contrary to thy word, I am crushed under the Lord, under the load, and I can do nothing without thy help. It seemed that as I prayed, a wave of light fell upon me, and a voice said, I will be with thee to strengthen thee. Since then, I have been resting in Jesus. I can hide in him. I am not going to carry this load any longer. I shall lay it down at the feet of my Redeemer. Brethren, shall we not all of us leave our loads there? Shall we not leave July 19th, December 6th, and all of the rest of this in Christ's hands? And when we leave this meeting, may it be with the truth burning in our souls like fire shut up in our bones. You will meet with those who will say, you are much too excited over this matter. You are too much in earnest. You should not be reaching for the righteousness of Christ and making so much of that. You should preach the law. As a people, we have preached the law until we are as dry as the hills of Gilboa that had neither dew nor rain. We must preach Christ in the law. And there will be sap and nourishment in the preaching that will be as food for the famished flock of God. We are not to trust in our own merits at all, but in the merits of Jesus of Nazareth. Our eyes must be anointed with eye cell. We must draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to us if we come in his own appointed way. Oh, that you may go forth as the disciples did after the day of Pentecost, and then your testimony will have a living ring, and souls will be converted to God. I am instructed to say to my fellow workers, if you would have the rich treasures of heaven, you must hold secret communion with God. Unless you do this, your soul will be as destitute of the Holy Spirit as were the hills of Gilboa of dew and rain. When you hurry from one thing to another, when you have so much to do that you cannot take time to talk with God, how can you expect power in your work?
even Moses could not go up at once into the mount, for he could not immediately approach so nigh unto God and endure the exhibitions of his glory. Six days was he preparing to meet with God. His common thoughts and feelings must be put away. During the six days, he was devoting his thoughts to God and sanctifying himself by meditation and prayer before he could be prepared to converse with his maker. If this was the state of Moses, what does that tell us is our state? What does that say we need to do in preparation for what is soon to come? And what is to be said to the priests? If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you. And I will curse your blessings, yea, I have cursed them already, because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feasts, and one shall take you away with it. Here again. If ye will not give glory unto my name. What are we told to do? The first angel says, fear God. The second angel, give glory to him. If we will not give glory unto his name, we will not be benefited by the third angel. Have we not learned this lesson from history? Have we not seen this already in this world? Do we need to see it again? Is this the path that we need to follow? Now, dung, according to Crudens. Dung is represented by anything that is nauseous or loathsome as the carcass of the dead. As Jeremiah would say, at that time, saith the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of his princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought and whom they have worshiped they shall not be gathered nor be buried they shall be for dung upon the face of the earth speak thus saith the lord even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field and all as the handful after the harvest men, none shall gather them. Hebrew 1828, Domen. The wicked man, says Job, shall perish forever like his own dung, which men cast away with contempt and with a, with abhorrence yet he shall perish forever like his own dung they which have seen him shall say where is he now hebrew 1561 is taken from the chaldean language galel to spread dung upon the face expresses the greatest of contempt undervalue and scorn so when the Lord is going and is saying here to the priests in Malachi 2 and 3, behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your face. 
is he not expressing that he's sick of what's going on? Is he happy with what's being what's being said? Again, Malachi 2.1 says, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. Malachi wrote more for our time than he did for his own. So if he's writing this to the priests, he's writing it to us. Is this the curse we wish to have God give to us? Is this the reason why the church has chosen not to deeply study this with Malachi? Hebrew 65, 67, Peresh. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3, 8, I count all things but done that I may win Christ. All things without Christ are as dung, utterly insufficient to procure our pardon and acceptance with God. If we take it from the Greek, Greek 4657, skubalon, thrown to the dogs, or refuse. 2 Kings 9 37. And the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. And we've studied before with Ezekiel. Ezekiel 4, 12 and 15, and thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. But Ezekiel, then he said unto me, lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread forth therewith. Now, this particular phrase Hebrew 68.32, Siufa, is also found in Joel 2.20. That's an interesting number that we get to on this part of Joel. The prophet Zephaniah says, and I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men, because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be as poured out as dust, and their flesh as the dung. As we continue, what kind of a warning is noted? And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me, and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the lord of hosts but ye are departed out of the way ye have caused many to stumble at the law ye have corrupted the covenant of levi saith the lord of hosts therefore have i also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Now, as we go through this, the premise that I'm operating on, as I have been led to st this study, 
is this covenant is Leviticus 25 and 26. And that by setting aside Leviticus 25 and 26, we are seeing the effect as what befell the children of Israel when they chose to worship a golden calf at the foot of Sinai. Now, what do we find in this next section? We're going to have three verses here. The heading in my Bible says, and the people for marrying strange wives. Have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother? By profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. Now, comment that was made, and then I'm going to go right back into what I've just read. Cow's dung reminds me of the golden calf idolatry in Exodus 32. Also mention of the moon in Jeremiah 8, and the carcass is displayed under it. If Sinai is derived from sin, the moon god worship by the Samaritans, the Arabs, the Akkadians, God is asserting his worship and he himself are superior to all of these superstitions. How do you feel about that point? I think it's spot on. Now, these verses, Malachi 2, verses 10 through 12, is this literal or figurative? How should we take this? Well, it'd be figurative. Okay, so if it's figurative. People are marrying strange wives. What can we what can we derive from this? Well, strange wives, women. women are churches. This would be Protestantism. Okay. Would we agree with that? That's a good point, Theodore. It really is. I think it has to be. Mm -hmm. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, that accepts the Protestant teachings, the master and the scholar. Out of the tabernacles of Jacob and him that offering offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. These are going to be cut off. Figuratively, it does it not mean that the Lord will not accept their offerings? That he has cut these people off from spiritual Israel? Is that the condition we wish to find ourselves in? What are you thinking? And the purpose of this study is to have conversation. Mm -hmm. So. Well, yeah, there's just, it's moving too fast for me almost. Um, you mean I've taken a page out of your book? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the whole thing here is we can see that there's a covenant because Malachi is really about a message to us. Um, you know, especially when you look at chapter two to the priests, and even when it talks about the purifying of the sons of Levi, uh, I mean, which, you know, we'd never really think about, I mean, in, as a general Adventist, we just kind of take it, this is God's people, but it's very specific. It's the priests and the Levites. As we've come to understand it, the priests are representing the 144,000. Yeah. Well, I believe I do. Well, the Levites, are they not those that will be the teachers of the covenant and of the testimony? Mm -hmm. This is a warning today because we have seen the effect when the covenant is set aside. If we choose to set aside God's covenant, we are no better than the mixed multitude that were causing trouble within the camp. Um, just a thought. I mean, we haven't got to Malachi chapter six, but this is a message written to the priests and the Levites, correct? Okay. So Malachi, Malachi only has four chapters. Yeah, I'm just, just about to say that, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, if you've got if you've got five and six, and we don't have that in the Bible, I'd like to see it. Okay. <laughs> I, I said five and six. You said six. Verse six. Malachi three, oh, verse six. Well, that's different. I, I think I was trying to talk about. Anyway, I'm not sure what I said. <laughs> <laughs> we, okay. we're, we're not going to get into Malachi three quite yet, but go ahead. But yeah, so in Malachi three, it's talking about because the priests and Levites, they're the one who received the tithes and offerings. But here it's talking to them about tithes and offerings. And what is a tithe? Remnant or a God's portion, a tenth. It's a tenth, which is the remnant, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yep. It's a symbol of the remnant. So, you know, we, we often just read this literally, but it actually has a symbolic way in, in which we can understand this. Because God is telling us to bring the remnant. Well, here again. Verses chat from chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Yeah. Is this not recognizing that God is the creator and the owner of everything? And if we're dealing treacherously with those around us then we're no better than the heathens we're no better than those that do not that do not know god did abraham ever deal treacherously against any of the nations that were around him no I mean, he was, he was asked to come out under the oaks and enter into a covenant, was he not? Was it, was, wasn't he brought into one where they noted this by the well of Sheba, the um, well of the covenant? The well of the seven times. Yeah. Okay. The covenant that he entered into there, the Sheba, the seven times, is what is currently being set aside 
within the church. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Or if Abraham is to be our father and those that forsake, forsake the, the covenant have not one father, as, as it says in Malachi, they cast off their father. Agreed. Okay. The work done in the temple upon the Sabbath was in harmony with the law. Yet the same labor, if employed in ordinary business, would be a violation of it. The act of plucking and eating the grain to sustain the bodily strength to be used in the service of God was right and lawful. Jesus then crowned his argument by declaring himself the Lord of the Sabbath. One above all question and above all law. The infinite judge acquits the disciples from blame and appealing to the very statutes they are accused of violating. But Jesus did not let the matter drop without administrating a rebuke to his enemies. He declared that in their blindness, they had mistaken the object of the Sabbath. Said he, but if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Ye would not have condemned the guiltless. He then contrasted their many heartless rites with the truthful integrity and the tender love that he should characterize the true worshipers of God. For I desired mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But they, like men, have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Jesus was reared among this people, so marked with bigotry and prejudice, and he therefore knew that in healing upon the Sabbath day, he would be regarded as a transgressor of the law. He was aware that the Pharisees would seize upon such acts with great indignation and thereby seek to influence the people against him. He knew that they would use these works of mercy as strong arguments to affect the minds of the masses, who had all their lives been bound by Jewish restrictions and exactions. Nevertheless, he was not prevented by this knowledge from breaking down the senseless wall of superstition that barricaded the Sabbath, and teaching men that charity and benevolence were lawful upon all days. You will find this passage from Signs of the Times, November 30th, 1876, but you will also find it in Story of Redemption, page 49.2, and Second Spirit of Prophecy. The Pharisees took upon themselves the responsibility of deciding concerning the burdens and duties of others according to the judgment of their own carnal minds. They accepted money from persons in return for excusing them from their vows. And in some cases, crimes of an aggravated character were passed over in considerations of large sums of money paid to the authorities by the transgressor. At the same time, these hypocritical priests were exact in the matter of sacrifices and ceremonies, as if it were possible for cold forms to blot out the unrepentant sins of their daily lives. The Lord said unto Samuel, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and in sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken better than the fat of rams. No outward service, even in that which is required by God, can be a substitute for an obedient life. The Creator desires heart service of His creatures. I'm going to skip over a couple of things.
In the New Testament, language very similar is addressed to professed Christians who seek the friendship of the world above the favor of God. So in the New Testament, we find that those that are seeking to study and be acknowledged as scholars that follow other than Miller's rules are seeking the friendship of the world above the favor of God. Says the Apostle James, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Yeah. I, I remember when I first, uh, you know, was a very young Adventist. I might've been an Adventist for just a little over a year, year and a half, maybe. And I went to uh, a camp meeting and, you know, I was talking with some of the pastors there and, you know, I was a, I was a fairly young man. They saw I was knowledgeable in, in the Bible and, and, and that I was a new Adventist and they were encouraging me to get an education at, um, at uh, the Canadian union college, which is the college mm -hmm. of Alberta. And, you know, I had a hard time understanding their perspective, but but one thing they said, and, and I remember one pastor telling me, well, if you want anybody to listen to you, you need to be, you know, you need to go to school, right? There's no point you telling people things you've learned if you haven't been educated. And, and, and that's the friendship of the world. Yep. Yeah. The idea that somehow um, I need the acknowledgement of others in order to know that what I'm saying is the truth. Now, we do need fellowship, right? I mean, there is a great benefit in studying with others. I'm, I'm not a person who believes that I should just study on my own and that God can show me everything myself. I think that's just as foolish. Um, there are times we have to because there's no one to study with. But there's a great benefit in studying with others, but not submitting to their discipline, to their authority. So that, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. I do. Yeah. So that makes you an adulterer and an adulteress, well, if you're a woman. Yep. It's difficult because there are those that wish to press the point that you must have your degrees, you must have your letters. How, how can this man teach as he is? Where did he receive his education? Yet we are told that had Christ or John the Baptist studied according to the schools of the Pharisees, mm -hmm. they would have been completely unfit for their own work. Mm -hmm. Christ declared, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. This do, and thou shalt live. This commandment, which he had given to Moses when enshrouded in the pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, he again lays down as the condition of eternal life. Manuscript 26, 1896, the following paragraph. In Leviticus 19 are recorded words given by Christ to Moses to speak to the children of Israel. Read what the people of God in ancient times were enjoined to do and what not to do. For these are the principles contained in the royal law. 
Ye shall have no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, no honor nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Personal preferences and partiality are not to appear in the life of the Christian. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Here faithful dealing with sins practiced by those who claim to be children of God is enjoined. Be they men in poverty or be they mighty men, handling large responsibilities, no partiality is to be shown to those in the wrong. No hypocrisy practiced in dealing with them, whatever their position. If that position involves sacred interests, God's faithful watchmen are to be the more earnest and determined that the fear of God, not one evil principle shall pass unnoticed. If those in the wrong refuse to repent and correct their faults, let them be separated from the work for the corrupting principles of evil will leaven all with whom they are connected. Very difficult admonition to take, but it's one for this time. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. This authority is undisputed. The stranger that dwelleth with you shall be unto you as one born among you. And thou shalt love him as thyself, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in mid-yard, in weight, or in measure, just balances, just weights, a just ephah, and a just hen shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt." Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes and all my judgments and do them. I am the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord, which sanctify you. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Ye shall observe to do therefore as the Lord your God has commanded you. Ye shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that ye may live, and that it may be well with you, and that ye shall possess. Here is the work of the minister of righteousness. And this is one of Mrs. White's very interesting paragraphs because it goes back over Malachi chapter 2 verses 6 through 13 and ends on verse 17. The exact portion that we are currently studying. Okay. You will find this repeated in Review and Herald 1st December 1896. Today, the enemy of all truth is working as never before to make of no effect the binding precepts of God's law. His theories and suggestions are presented so ingeniously, so plausibly, that the so-called Christian world would have taken their stand under his banner. By pen and by voice, they are endeavoring to tear down the standard of God's government and in its place erect a human theoretical 
standard. Are we not seeing this occurring currently in the United States? Are we not seeing this going on in many other areas? To false teachers in our day, as well as to those living in Malachi's time are spoken the words. Therefore, I have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. Again, we are referring here to Malachi chapter 2. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? Even when ye say, every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? If you have not had the time to read these articles from Southern Watchmen, please do so this week. What was the first love of the pioneers and what metaphorically has been abandoned? What representation is only provided with figurative respect? Here we are given a point in the book of Malachi where the wives of their youth are put aside. So again, I ask, what was the first love of the pioneers? The word of God. The word of God. And we have these two tables, the 1843 and the 1850. And what is the cornerstone on, the, on these two tables? The seven times. Yeah. Multiple times. Yeah, they're both 25 20 charts. So as we continue. Okay, so just just a thought here. So so I'm stuck way back in Genesis. Okay. Um dealing with uh uh the well of Beersheba, so the agreement that he makes with Abimelech at the well of the seven times. Right. Um, because we know that the word seven times is, is not, and one of the reasons I believe that it's written in the way it is in Leviticus 26, is it's actually a symbol of the covenant, of the oath that God makes, correct? Correct. And we see in Genesis 15, that when God makes that covenant, it has that structure of a chiasm. And then it's worked out in uh, the story of the children of Israel from Moses leaving uh, Haran until the Israelites come into Egypt. And we have that, that chiasm, the 430-year chiasm. And we see it also worked out in Jacob himself because he has the two wives, right? The one he loved and the one that he he hated um, Leah, right? So you got Rachel and Leah. And he gets, he works for Laban when he's 77. He works for two periods of seven years. Um, you know, what I, I don't think that we could ever do is that we could never separate the seven times from the covenant or from the oath, from God's promise where he swears by himself. You would agree with me there. Yes. Yeah. So now when I look at Exodus 19, um, I mean, it doesn't tell us explicitly what it is that the people said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. So is this hidden by God? Well, yeah. And, well, what I'm saying is that there may have been 
Yeah, well, it's hidden in some ways. So we don't know exactly what words Moses says. It doesn't mean that we get Exodus 25 and 26 word for word spoken at that time. But definitely the essence of the blessings and the curses. Because when you look at the blessings and the curses, are not they a structural chiasm? Okay. Right. When you look at a chiasm, two women, the one uh, Jacob loved, the one he hated, uh, the 430 year structure, Canaan and Egypt. Um, you know, anytime you look at these chiasms, they, they separate these two aspects, you know, Christ's ministry on earth, Christ's ministry in heaven, when he confirms the covenant with many for one week, or even the counterfeit covenant. You know, um, which is paganism and papalism. So I don't know if I have to argue that Leviticus 26 is a word for word representation of what is spoken, but definitely its essence is, is a covenant. Um, and that's well understood by anybody who studies Leviticus 26, that it's about the covenant. And that must be the essence of what was presented in Exodus 19. Okay. But, you know, we don't have it explicitly saying what it was. I mean, you know, it says, say these words to you, I bear you on eagle's wings and brought you unto myself. Now it could be like, and this is Exodus 19, four, right? And then verse five, now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar, peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Now, he must have said more than that, right? So it says, Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all the word which the Lord commanded them him. And all the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Now, it could be that, that this is all that Moses says to them. And, and they're just saying, whatever the Lord is going to speak, we will do, being the Ten Commandments. But it, it seems to me that they must have more than that. Okay. Could I, yes. Could I, could I add to that from Patriarchal Please, Prophets? Okay. It says... Um, Moses returned to the camp after, um, maybe I should read the paragraph before. Okay. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For the earth, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, which you just basically repeated a minute ago. Yeah. Moses returned to the camp, and having summoned the elders of Israel, he repeated to them the divine message. The answer was, all that the Lord hath spoken, we will do. Then she says, thus they entered into a solemn covenant with God, pledging themselves to accept him as their ruler, by which they became, in a special sense, the subjects of his authority. And that's Patriarchs and Paragraphs 303, Paragraph 2 and 3. And it looks to me like it's talking about uh, kind of the sense that you just last suggested, that they were accepting what the Lord was going to say to them, that they, they were accepting him as their ruler, and that they were subjects of his authority. And therefore, he gave them his, his law. Right. And, 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 and so, so they're making this covenant. They don't have all of the, all of, you know, Leviticus and, and Exodus and the 10 commandments yet spoken to them. Or written down. Sorry. But, but when they're making this oath of covenant, we can already connect the seven times in this covenant, even if it's not explicitly stated. So, 
you understand what I'm saying, Dwight, here. I'm okay. I, yeah, I apologize. This, this, my, do my dog decided to bark. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, the idea that Leviticus 25 and 26 are, are then, you know, read to the people then, I don't think that could be the case based on, on the study that I'm doing here. But, but definitely we can connect the oath or the covenant with the seven times. Leviticus 26 is ex an expression of that covenant. That we can agree upon for certain, right? Okay, no disagreement. The, yeah. reason, the reason that I'm being very adamant on this point, mm -hmm. as Brother Chris just read, yeah. from Exodus chapter 19, verses 4 to the first half of verse 6, mm -hmm. initially, the children of Israel the all of the tribes of Israel were going to be a nation of priests. Mm -hmm. So the admonition that is given to the priests directly in Leviticus 25 and 26, if I'm understanding this right, it would have been a repeat of what all of the people agreed to and what they apostatized from yeah well now yeah in some way so i'm saying that in some way there should be an essence of that in this covenant that's made on mount sinai before the ten commandments is spoken but i don't know that i can find yet any place in the spirit of prophecy or in the bible where we could say that leviticus 25 and 26 were where what Moses was given to say to the people, he's giving this. And we know that he obviously said a little bit more because the Bible's quite brief. I mean, he's not going to just say these words. He, he's going to add to it, um, and, you okay. know, expand upon it. But, but I, I still think we can see the, the, the seven times in this covenant, whether, whether we have Leviticus 26 there or not. Okay, what, what I'm going to refer to now is First Spirit of Prophecy, page 238, beginning okay. at paragraph 2. Okay. I'm going to read four paragraphs, and this was not part of the study. Okay. God would have his people understand that he alone should be the object of their worship. And when they should overcome the idolatrous nations around them, they should not preserve any of the images of their worship, but utterly destroy them. Many of these heathen deities were very costly and of beautiful workmanship, which might tempt those who had witnessed idol worship so common in Egypt to even regard these senseless objects with some degree of reverence. The Lord would have his people know that it was because of the idolatry of these nations, which had led them to every degree of wickedness, that he would use the Israelites as his instruments to punish them and destroy their gods. I will send before the, I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come, and I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. Mm -hmm. And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate, and the beast of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee, until thou be increased and inherit the land. And I will set my bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out before thee. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare unto thee. 
these promises of God to let to his people were on the condition of their obedience. If they would serve the Lord fully, he would do great things for them. After Moses had received the judgments from the Lord and had written them for the people, also the promises on condition of obedience, the Lord said unto him, come up unto the Lord, thou and Arab and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship ye afar off. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come nigh. Neither shall the people go up with him. And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. Moses had written not the Ten Commandments, but the judgments which God would have them observe and the promises on the condition that they would obey him. He read this to the people, and they pledged themselves to obey all of the words which the Lord had said. Moses then wrote their solemn pledge in a book and offered sacrifice unto God for the people. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people, and they said, all that the Lord hath said we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. The people repeated their solemn pledge to the Lord to do all that he had said and to be obedient. Now. Yeah. So that's mostly Exodus 23 and 24. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm asking the question if the nation of Israel were to be a nation of priests would the covenant that Moses read to the children of Israel be any different than the covenant that was presented before the priests No, well, because there's supposed to be a kingdom of priests in a holy nation. That was their okay. intent. No. Now, well, so, so the interesting thing here, so they make the covenant. They say, all the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient prior to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Then the law is given on Mount Sinai. And, and they're going to give some, some specific laws about slaves, about retribution, um, about social justice, it says. Obviously, it means a little bit different than nowadays. Um, and then chapter 23 is going to deal with uh, the Sabbaths and the festivals. So it's going to talk about the seventh year rest of the land. Um, and it's going to talk about uh, the, some of the different feasts. And then the, he's going to make the promise of the conquest of Canaan. So that's the part that she was quoting about. Uh, the first part was dealing with Canaan. And, and we can see that's connected with Leviticus 26. And then chapter 24, where they're going to then once again say, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And then she's quite clear that these judgments are not the Ten Commandments, but it's the judgments that were written down. Agreed. Yeah. Now, when, when I'm looking at Leviticus 25, verse 1. Yeah. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, and again, we can reference this right back to Exodus 19, 1. Yeah. Because that, in the, in the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. Yeah. And so all those things that are going to be said to them in chapter 25 and 26 would be part of this book of the law. Because when we close Leviticus 26, verse 46. Yeah. It says, 
these are the statutes and the judgments and the laws mm -hmm. which the Lord made between him and the children of Israel in Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. Right. So we would have to say it's this Leviticus 25 and 26. This, this is after the Ten Commandments are spoken and they make the covenant in chapter 24 when, the, when he, has, he has these written down. And he's going to sprinkle the blood upon the people and upon the book. It would have to include Leviticus 25 and 26. Yes. Yeah, that's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying. Okay. And that I can agree with. Because that's, that's the conclusion I came to. But they, first, but they first make the covenant with God before the Ten Commandments are given. And, and the covenant they make is based upon Leviticus 25 and 26. Yes. Not upon the Ten Commandments themselves. Right. According to Spirit of Prophecy. Correct. Okay. But but in there, so when they first make that covenant, they say all the Lord has said we will do. Then they hear the Ten Commandments, and then Moses um, gives them this book of the law. Now, what generally people would say is that the book of the law, the judgments, and so forth, are referring to chapter 21 to 23. But we can see that those are still reflected, some of that, in Leviticus 25 and 26. The point that... But I think Leviticus 25 and 26 are out of place. Okay. That they're, they're added to the book of Leviticus because they pertain to the Levites. The but, they, but if if the nation had done what it was supposed to, the entire nation would have technically been what we would call Levites. Right. Exactly. And so this is before the rebellion that happens. So this all fits in with, with what we've been saying. It's just we've I've had to sort through it just to make sure that I understand it properly. So they make the covenant with God. They're given the Ten Commandments. They're given these judgments, which would include Leviticus 25 and 26. And, and then Moses goes up into the... Um, so they, they, they've, they've heard the Ten Commandments, but they haven't received the two tables of stone yet. So when they make the covenant, it's before they receive the two tables of stone. Right. Because those tables are broken. They don't make a covenant over those two tables of stone. They, they, they do over the words of the covenant, that is the words of the Ten Commandments. But the covenant is made with this book of these judgments. Correct? That's, that's the conclusion you're coming to. That's the conclusion in a nutshell. Okay. okay. And that, you know, that's the view that I've had for a long time, except I didn't put Leviticus 25 and 26 in there. I'd always understood that they made a covenant before Moses went up into the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments, and that covenant was based on something else, though it does include the Ten Commandments. It gives reference for the Ten Commandments. Yeah, the Ten, Ten Commandments are part of that. But there's more to it than just the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are not the covenant. Okay. Right. That, and, but, but they are part of the covenant. You know, I'm not saying that they're not. They are part of it. Okay. So sorry for that. But I just wanted to get that all straight. Okay. Were... Anybody else with a thought on that? Because you're not going to get finished today. <laughs> I just was sorry. What was the uh, spirit of prophecy passage? Uh, spirit of prophecy passage I was referring to was. First Spiritual Gifts, page 300. No, no you've got uh, First Spirit of Prophecy. Yeah, that's what I meant. First Spirit of Prophecy. Um, uh, beginning at page 238. 
And then third spiritual gifts, 270. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. So we have this next section to get into, but like you're, you're sagely pointing out, we will not be able to get this far into it because there's quite a bit here figuratively that we're going to need to cover. Mm -hmm. So is there an issue with regarding the covenant with the priests as being the same covenant that was offered to the nation. No, I think that's clear that he was wanting them to be a kingdom of priests. And that his initial purpose was not what ended up happening. Okay. Now, if we apply this to ourselves today, do we have a problem with understanding that this was the same covenant being offered to the corporate church and that when they chose to seek the friendship with the world that they wound up with God's enmity. Right. So they ended up rejecting the covenant and that's why we are symbolically the priests of the priests, right? Okay. Calling the Levites. And, and we can see that, too, when, you know, in the study uh, Friday night, dealing with um, uh, the golden calf, we can see that it's Levi who stands with Moses. Right. And that's why they become the priests. Exactly. And, and so the same thing is happening today. And so God is saying, who's on the Lord's side? And that's why the issue about how we study, you know, I was thinking about it earlier. You know, Parminder, he made a lot about methodology. But his was completely a counterfeit. Because his was based upon listening to man. Exactly. He says, well, you need to use the right methodology, but you don't know how to use it. You have to go to the proper schools and be taught so that you can then use it. And so you have to submit to the leadership because they know how to use the rules. Well, that's not God's method. God's method is based upon a kingdom of priests and a holy nation that everyone studies and understands God's word because God doesn't need somebody to mediate between us and him other than Christ. We don't need a man to mediate for us. We don't need um, somebody to tell us what is truth because God can speak to us. I mean, that's his purpose. Is, is uh, that, that was his original purpose is that you have a kingdom of priests. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests to the whole world. They were supposed to, to share the gospel with the world, but instead a work had to be done for them first. Yep. And we're in, we're in the same boat here today. So I think I finally got what you're saying. I think you've got it very clearly. Now, is there any other thoughts? And I'll, let's, let's approach it this way. We're going to open by returning to this thought process next week. Mm -hmm. There are several points yet to be addressed. There's a lot that I've been led to that is still making me really shake my head because there's so much within both Leviticus 25 and 26 that really has never been addressed. So we have our work cut out for us. Mm -hmm. yeah so okay shall we close with prayer yeah
Father in heaven, this study is showing me just how destitute I really am of your righteousness and how much your, your righteousness is really needed at this time. I ask for guidance, Father, for your direction, for your blessing, and even for your chastisement. Help me to understand that which needs to be done. Be with each one that has been in this study and those that will be viewing the study later. I pray for your blessing upon them. Ask, Father, that you will be with each as we consider these, these points, direct us and guide us, so that all may be done to your glory for this. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.